to hold on to my wrist with one. We're delighted this morning to be able to observe the ordinance of baptism. And it's my joy to baptize Pete upon his public profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Pete, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism. And rise to walk in newness of life. fall but don't you waver you keep on living in the way God wants you to don't get discouraged you keep on giving soon it will come back to you keep on casting your bread upon the water Soon it's gonna come back home on every wave. Keep on casting your bread upon the water. Soon it's gonna come back home on every wave. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Soon it's gonna come back home on every wave. Keep on working, seeking the kingdom Instead of working for your needs You gotta keep on sharing the love of Jesus Cause you know growing comes from planting seeds Keep on casting your bread upon the water Soon it's gonna come back home on every wave Keep on casting your bread upon the water. Soon it's going to come back home on every wave. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Soon it's going to come back home on every wave. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Soon it's going to come back home. On every wave. Thank you, Brenda. I invite you to turn in your Bibles again to the ninety second Psalm, or the ninety first. Excuse me, 91st. Change pages. I changed Bibles and it changed pages on me. Psalm 91, verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. To me... That is one of the most beautiful expressions in all of the Scripture, partially because it is poetic. But more importantly, it's not because it is poetic, but because it holds up for you and for me one of the greatest privileges that can come to the child of God, that if we dwell in the shelter of the Most High, we will rest in the shadow 
of the Almighty. Now there's a difference of opinion as to who wrote these words. There are those who would say that this is a psalm of David and, and they think that perhaps David wrote everything that is recorded in the book of Psalms. But the Bible seems to indicate in the superscription of the Psalms that preceded this that it was Moses who penned these words. It was Moses who gave vent to that feeling of shelter and grace and mercy that God provided in the days of his trouble. As he traveled through the wilderness with a cantankerous bunch of folks that he was called upon to lead out of the wilderness of sin through the wilderness of the desert into the land of promise, he leaned hard off time upon that shadow of the Almighty, that tabernacle of the Most High. And so it is that he talks about that dwelling in the shelter that God has provided and living in the shadow of God himself. It is this psalm that is quoted by our Lord when the devil, or quoted by the devil when he tempted Jesus on the mountain and tried to get him to, to fail in his mission in the very beginning. It is that passage that I think has calmed many a troubled and throbbing heart and soul in the hour of its trouble. It really matters little who wrote it. He penned the expression of the hearts of many. Now we must understand that not every Christian occupies the same position in the world. That we are all saved and we are all saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. But there is much more to the Christian life than simply being saved. That is the beginning. It is the essential start. It is the place where we all began, but it is not where we end. There is much more than just that. And the blessings that the writer of this verse, whether it be Moses or David or somewhere else, even if the Holy Spirit as he ministers through whomever it is, is given in a very gentle way. And we are reminded that God is no respecter of persons. And it is as if he is saying anyone who fulfills the conditions of this verse will have the blessing that is promised provided the condition is met. He must dwell in the secret place of the Most High. If he does, he will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And the blessing here promised is that all who believe can have it, but only those who are in fellowship will receive it. Every child of God, I think, looks for a sanctuary, looks for an inward sanctuary, a mercy seat, but not all of us dwell at that place. We run to it at times and we enjoy it occasionally and sometimes we glimpse the face of Him who abides within the tabernacle, but we do not continually abide in that mysterious presence. But the verse says it's possible. It's possible for you and for me to abide in the shelter of the Most High, to remain. That word abide speaks of staying there. And it's my heart's desire that as we share together about this verse, as we relate with this verse one-on-one, -on -one, you and I, with it that somehow I will catch a glimpse and you will catch a glimpse of the reality that God is promising to us, the secret of His presence. May God help us to understand that, everyone. I have been to the mountaintop of Christian experience. I have stood there and enjoyed, as have you, the face of Him who loved me and gave Himself for me. And I know that you have experienced that as I have. But the text says, we shall, we may, it is possible for us not only to visit the mountaintop and to know the presence of him who loved us and gave himself for us, but to abide at the mountaintop forever. We may abide there in our thoughts we may all the while in the midst of the thickness of the battle for the kingdom of God know the presence of God in our lives. I like the verse. I like it because I believe it is sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb. It is so restful to know that there is a place in this world where we can abide. A place, sometimes we call it home, sometimes we call it somewhere else, but all of us want that place in this world where we can abide, a place where we can go. 
And there's something about the fact that the place that God promises is a secret place that wins me over. A place where no one else knows it is a secret place just for me and my God. A place intended for me, intended for me alone and not anyone else. When I'm there, I find that the world is vanishing away from me and I find myself in the presence of my Lord. There was a poet who once wrote the words, I love in solitude to shed the penitential tear and all his promises to plead when no one but God can hear. That quiet, solitude, secret place in the shadow that interests me for there has never been a shadow without light you have never seen anywhere wherever you've been a shadow that was not in the middle of the light light causes the shadow and so if I'm abiding in the shadow of the almighty then somehow I must be in a place where there is light and glory but there's something else. If I'm abiding in the shadow of the Almighty, it means I'm near to Him. For the shadow is adjacent to, and wherever He goes, His shadow goes. And I've discovered that when I walk in the sunlight, my shadow goes everywhere that I go. It does not desert me. It does not leave me. It is always near me. It is immediately to me. And if I abide in his shadow, then somehow I mo know that I am in his presence. I am near him. I can reach forth my hand and touch him. I can lift up mine eyes and behold him. I can see him face to face. There is a sense in which God is near. There is a sense in which God is always near. He is in all things and he is everywhere, but there is another sense in which he is in the secret place near to me where everyone else is a stranger and I am the king. In the 119th Psalm, the psalmist begins to write about the presence of God and in a very general sort of way, he would say that he has been in the process of beating out with a golden gold ore for the process of refining it. And as he records about the presence of God in creation and the presence of God in our world in a general sort of way, suddenly it is as though the one of whom he is speaking has drawn very near to him and bends over him and begins to whisper to him in that 51st verse when he says, Thou art near, O God. And I think how happy we would be if we could attain to the place where we would say, Thou art near, O God, to me. How useful I would be, how happy I would be, how peaceful I would be if I could know that Thou art near. And it is possible. It is possible for those of us who are in the midst of perplexing cares of life to know that He is near. And that the Master bids us to abide in Him. And He does not limit either the meaning or the number of people who may abide. I'm certain. I am convinced with all of my soul that it rests with me and with you to determine whether we shall take advantage of our privilege of abiding in his presence it is our choice the typical reference in the passage must be I think to the holy place of the tabernacle where those priests were privileged to go in and out of that place and know the presence of God Peter reminds us that there is a new dispensation a holy priesthood so that it is possible to enter in on that ground as well and it's that interpretation that must follow that describes that we are bidden into the tabernacle just beyond the veil is that glory cloud that filled the presence of God within the room and that magnificence of the surroundings. 
the gold and the silver, the fine linen that covered the table, all of the extravagance and glory of that room and all of its representative greatness and richness and yet the thing that made it significant beyond the outer rooms and the rest of the tabernacle was not the gold and the silver and the extravagance of its wealth and the fine linen but it was the presence of God in that place and only the priest could go in and it is called the secret place of God the writer of Hebrew tells us, saying, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way that he hath consecrated unto us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. You see, a Christian is wrong. He is wrong as wrong can be if he thinks that in all of life there must be toil and strife. And that's all. There is an abiding even here in this world, in this life with its sweet, undisturbed communion in the midst of the tempest with God. You see, a dwelling place is a home. It is not a temporary shelter to which I flee on an occasion to get momentary or slight relief from a difficulty. It is a home where I abide. I do not fly as the bird ahead of the storm into the boughs of the home simply to avoid the storm and then again out into the world, but I abide in the home. It is my restful place. The Hebrew expression shall abide is literally shall pass the night. I think it's a glorious, glorious expression. What place in life is as restful as your home? Now, I know that there is rest that comes to one the moment he accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and knows the pardon and freedom from his sin. And the burden of that sin is gone. Jesus said, come unto me and I will give you rest. That's his promise. He has never failed us. And he immediately follows that by saying, take my yoke upon me and learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Come to me. And I guess that you can get that former part of that without the latter part, but it's hard for me to understand how. I don't know any place more comfortable than home. When you're at home, you can be free from the annoyances of the world. You can know that soothing and quietness that seems somehow to calm the troubled soul within. In the 91st Psalm in this passage, he says, He shall cover you with his feathers. And I think that might be sacrilegious if it were not in the Bible. But the picture is that of an old mother hen or a bird who shelters her little ones and she brings them all up under her wings and she guards them in the nest that love has made. But look what the verse says. You will only dwell in the secret place you shall abide under his shadow and if that weren't a tender enough way to say it he follows it by saying he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings thou shalt trust home is a place of rest home is a place of security but home is also a place for explanations that's where we tell our secrets in the home you know we have our organizations and we make our pledges and our commitments to keep certain things secret but secrets have a way of being revealed at home for home is the place where information and explanation is transpiring if people in the world don't understand us, the folks at home at least listen to us. 
Those who love us, who are in our home, hear us and understand us. The 27th Psalm, David says that he wants to dwell in the house of the Lord, that he may inquire in his temple, that he might know when he was perplexed and confused and could not understand, he wanted to go to the place of God to understand. He said, thy way is in the sea. And thy path in the great waters and thy footsteps are not known. You can't see and understand God, he said. He is like the tracklessness of the sea. Then he says, I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Then I understood when I went into the dwelling place, the shelter of the Most High. Was it not Enoch with whom God walked and fellowshiped and told him things? Did he not walk with Moses at Midian and tell him things that Moses would never repeat? Did he not let John lean upon his bosom and there bend his head and whisper to him things that if spoken aloud would lose their significance? Was it not Paul who was lifted up into the heavens and when he came said, I heard things that it is not permitted, secrets that I cannot tell. For one, I have no language to repeat it, and two, they are secrets for me. And what about the conversation Peter had with Jesus after the denial? It turned his life around. He found power in it, and yet he never, ever revealed what was said as he abode in the secret place. And the same is true for Mark and a thousand others we could list. Jesus, the same yesterday and forever. And if I am only near enough to him, I may inquire of him of the mysteries of my life. And he who made known his way unto Moses will make known in the secret place his way unto me. I don't think that you can read these verses and the ones following without being impressed without being impressed with the fact that the most remarkable results following our abiding and dwelling in the secret place. When we ad abide and dwell in the secret place, there is a remarkable peace. In this world you shall have tribulation, says the Master, but in me you shall have peace. My peace give I unto thee, not as the world giveth I, but my peace. That peace that gives tranquility and stability in the tragic turmoil of life. I read recently about some kind of bug. I don't know what kind it was. I couldn't even say the name of it. But it sort of surrounds itself with a film of air. I don't know how it does that. But it had the power, the ability to surround itself with a film of air and once encompassed in that film of air would drop off into the middle of muddy, stagnant pools of water and the whole time remain unhurt because it was wrapped up in that little sphere of air that it had created. I sort of suspect that the believer, you and I, can be surrounded by the atmosphere of God in such a way that we can be surrounded by the turmoil and the troubles and the overflowing calamity of life and still know the peace of God and come away unscathed. And I think that's true whatever your occupation. I've been reading F.B. Meyer recently. And he tells in one of his books the story about a fellow by the name of Lawrence. Now, Lawrence was a simple-minded fellow who was a cook. And Dr. Meyer said that for 60 years, Lawrence cooked. But in that 60 years, he was always conscious, conscious of performing his duties... in the presence of God. That whether it was tedium 
or whether it was the glory of the Lord's Supper, he felt the presence of God. And I thought to myself, what a peace that man knew for 60 years. If you are so constantly engaged so that you have said it was impossible for you to enjoy your religion very much because you're so busy, you can still have your peace if you're in the secret place. I know it's impossible to keep two thoughts in your mind at the same time and do justice to both of them. I'm not even sure it's possible to keep two thoughts consciously in your mind at the same time. But I'm convinced that if you do, you can't do justice to both thoughts. But I also know that when the orator is speaking, he is conscious of his audience and their feeling and response, and at the same time, he is dwelling on what he's saying. Presenting those thoughts. I know that you can have your mind taken up in a book reading and studying, but your heart is conscious of the presence of somebody you love. Much like the mother with a small child in the other room in the crib and the mother's busy doing the housework, she's focused on all of the chores, she's absolutely involved in those, but at the slightest twerp out of that child, she's gone. There is a sense in which we can have our thoughts focused on one thing and still know the abiding sweet communion and fellowship with our God in the secret place. Those people who heard Jesus speak those words, Peace, my peace, I leave with you. Not as the world giveth I, I, it is my peace that I give. Therefore, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. David found that to be true in Psalm 27, didn't he, when he said, In time of trouble, he will hide me in the pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle. He will hide me. That pavilion was a large tent in the midst of the camp where he could go. And when he was there, nothing could befall him. Even though the enemy come, he was safe. the secret of his tabernacle it is a place of purity it is a place where surrounded only by that which is pure you know it's easy isn't it to live for God and to know the peace of God that passes understanding and the joy of our faith when we are surrounded in an environment where the scenery lifts us to heaven where everything is conducive to worship. But what about when things are not? What about when things are not conducive, when our world begins to be in turmoil and it tosses and we find ourselves shifting on the sea of life? And we find ourselves disturbed by our circumstance. We find that our lives beginning to close in upon us. You know why David, one of the reasons why David wanted to dwell in the house of the Lord, he said that I might behold the beauty of the Lord. Somewhere in my life, in the midst of all that troubles me, I want to see the beauty of the Lord. One of the things that so embitters and so hardens so many in our world is that they never see the beauty of God. They always see the seamy side of life. And it's hard to be sympathetic and it's hard to be soft when all you see is the hardness of life. I wish it were possible for me to make plain to you and to myself so that we could understand what it means and what waits for us in the secret place. When I think of the gorgeousness of the Holy of Holies in that ancient tabernacle, I think, what a type, what a picture this is 
those marvelous curtains hanging in their place with all of the gold and the blue and the purple and the fine linens twisted together with threads of gold and the beauty of the cherubim and the embroiderment upon the garments and that table and that box and that cha- all of that stuff. I think about the beauty of that place and I discover that God has a place far more glorious, far more beautiful and pure in the heart of his believer where the vision of God is promised. When I think about that, I wonder why we do not endeavor to dwell in the shelter of the Most High more frequently. Behold, what a tragedy to come and say God was in this place, and I knew it not. It is a place of power. You know, we really want power. We want power to live our lives. We want to be able to cry out in the darkness of life that we are able to conquer and to be victorious in the living of our lives in the midst of our trial. You know, there is no promise that I'm aware of in the Bible that we will have intellect. There is no promise that I'm aware of that says we will have human might. But there is a promise that says that after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall receive power. In the fourth chapter of Chronicles, there's the story, the 23rd verse, about a certain, a certain men who dwelt with the king in their work. And I'm convinced that there can be no effective service unless there is communion. Service is the outworking of relationship. And I must spend time with my God if I am able to do my God's bidding. And service is the outworking of communion. I've done something. I've talked about the secret place and the shadow of the Almighty, and I have left the very most practical of all questions unanswered. Perhaps you're even confused. You see, all of us want the peace that passes understanding. We all want to abide in the shadow of the Almighty. We all want to rest in the shelter of the Most High. We want to know that peace that keeps our soul stable. We want that which can cause us to sail through life without our ship being tossed and turned. We all want it. But how do you get it? Jesus said, none can know the Father but the Son. And he whom the Son reveals to him, him to, they can know him. You see, it's not possible to enter into the secret place of the Most High through any other door except through Jesus Christ, who said, I am the door, I am the way. You see, that's what Paul meant when he said, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometime were afar off are brought nigh by the blood of Christ. The secret place is the place where we meet God. And we meet God in Jesus Christ. You know, when you go to the beach, it's only when the water is still that you can see the pebbles below. And yet, you cannot go to Jesus except that you be able to see his face whatever hour that is and whatever trouble that befalls you. I think that's what Paul again was saying when he said, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And again, when the Bible says, He that keepeth my commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. You know what I've discovered I have discovered that I only, I have only to go the way I think Christ wants me to go and to do the things that I think he wants me to do to be able to stand on the mountaintop of Christian experience 
and know the secret place. I want to share a poem very quickly, and then I'm through. I'm not even sure it's, it's really a poem, but I think it is. It was written by a lady from Pakistan who had found the Lord, and it sort of summarizes what I'm trying to say to you. In the secret of his presence, how my soul delights to hide. Oh, how precious are the lessons which I've learned at Jesus' side. Earthly cares can never vex me, neither trials lay me low. For when Satan comes to tempt me to the secret place, I go. When my soul is faint and thirsty neath the shadow of his wings, there is cool and pleasant shelter and refreshing crystal springs. And my Savior rests beside me as we hold communion sweet. If I tried, I could not utter what he says when thus we meet. Only this I know, I tell him all my doubts, my griefs and fears. Oh, how patiently he listens, and my drooping soul he cheers. Do you think he ne'er reproves me? What false friend he would be if he never, never told me of the sins which he must see? Would you like to know the sweetness of the secret of the Lord? Go and hide beneath his shadow, and then... You shall find your reward. And whene'er you leave the silence of that happy meeting placed, you must mind and bear the image of the Master upon your face. When Moses came down from the mountain, his face was aglow, and they perceived that he had been with God. You're here this morning, and your life is tossed and it is troubled. I call upon you to give your life to he who calms the troubled sea of life, Jesus. Meet him in the secret place of your heart and do it today. Heavenly Father, there is an abiding place, a place of sweet release, a place, our Father, where we find not only comfort for our souls, but strength for living life. It is the secret place of our Lord. It is the shadow of the Almighty. It is the place where we meet our Lord in faith and hope. And so, Father, I pray this morning for that individual who's here who has never given their heart and their life to Jesus Christ, who knows not of a secret place, to which to flee. I pray that this morning they shall flee to the Lord in faith, trusting Him. For those who need to make another decision, perhaps to unite with this church, perhaps to recommit their lives, Thy will be done. For we ask it in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed and the organist playing, you're here this morning, you're not a Christian. The Bible says if you will believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, thou shalt be saved. The Bible says whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says that the greatest need of your life is Jesus Christ. But the marvelous thing is, he's the greatest need and he is the willing solution. He's ready to meet that need. He will take up abiding in your life if you ask him to. Behold, said Jesus, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and will open the door, I will come in and I will sup with him and he with me. Open your life to me. I will come in. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm meek and lowly of heart. Come unto me, and I'll give you rest. You're here, and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. The moment we're going to stand, and the choir's going to sing, I'm going to ask you to make your way to one of the aisles and come saying, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord. You need to unite with this church on promise of letter. You come. Perhaps you have some other decision. As we stand together with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, and the choir sings, you come. We'll meet you here in the front.
Don't forget, tonight we will be observing the ordinance of, the, of baptism again and start say the Lord's Supper. Uh, but we're not doing that tonight, so we are having baptism, so you plan to be here for that. And then for those other activities of the evening, the various choirs and activities, we'll see you here tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Delighted that all have been here who are here this morning. May God bless you. May God's grace be upon you all the day long. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Delighted to have all of our folks here. And I'm going to ask Brother Dick Smith, if he would, to dismiss us with a word of prayer. Brother Smith.